So again, sort of the enduring legacy of this election of 1824 and of the presidency of John Quincy Adams is the creation of a new party system, right? The um, <clears throat> party of Jackson, the Democrat party, is going to be built initially on a coalition of Jackson supporters, Crawford supporters, that fellow who ran in 1824 and lost, but who was a supporter of states' rights, and John C. Calhoun supporters, okay? And John C. Calhoun initially was more on board with the Adams and Clay vision of a national unity and a Republican unity, but there's a slave revolt in 1822 that unsettles him, and gradually he starts to become more and more of an advocate for states' rights, and this is particularly the case after Adams becomes president. And Calhoun at this point is vice president. He kind of took this as a consolatory prize for stepping out of the presidential race before the election. But um, he's increasingly an opponent to Adams. And so Calhoun, along with Jackson and Crawford, are going to form the coalition of Westerners and Southerners that will uh, the, the Democrat Party will be based on. So this is the party of state sovereignty, the party of supporting slavery's protection and potentially, in some cases, very strongly supporting its expansion and um, also kind of re-invoking in terms of their rhetoric, the rhetoric of Jefferson, of the independent, self-sufficient farmer. Okay, now <clears throat> Clay and Adams are going to carry forward uh, the um, vision for a federal government that unifies the country by doing, um, um, <clears throat> basically by providing the framework and the infrastructure to promote trade among the states, okay, and to protect um, the economy of the United States and promote it against the interests, say, of European economies, okay. And um, <clears throat> they are known initially as the National Republicans, but they soon become known as the Whigs. So the two-party system that we get going into the 1830s is going to be the Whigs versus the Democrats, okay? And the question of state sovereignty versus the sovereignty of the federal government had been addressed, um, <clears throat> I believe in 1803 or 4, by the McCulloch versus Maryland Supreme Court case, which basically said if a state law contradicts the federal law, the federal law wins out, okay? But that was not really, that didn't settle the issue. There was still all this division within the country about whether the states or the federal government should be sovereign. Okay, now uh, in terms of specific policies that kind of highlight these divisions, right? Um, well, the, probably the most uh, controversial one was, would be over tariffs. That is on taxing imports, especially manufactured goods coming from Europe. And Adams was in favor of tariffs to try to promote domestic manufacturing. And we talked Monday, it was about the, the gradual development of uh, textile mills in Lowell, Massachusetts. Okay, so manufacturing was very, um, on a, a, you know, there wasn't a lot of it in the United States before the Civil War, it was, it was contained, okay? But uh, something like a tariff is gonna encourage more manufacturing to take place and the growth of a business like the one in Lowell, Massachusetts, because uh, a tariff is gonna artificially inflate the price of, say, clothes that had been made in Britain, right? And it's going to make those clothes that are being made in Lowell, Massachusetts, more affordable, okay? What this tends to do for the consumer, though, is drive up prices, okay? So it's not good for the consumer. Uh, it's it's um, potentially good in the long run for the country if a manufacturing base can grow and um, <clears throat> provide jobs, but it's typically not something that, that's beneficial, at least in the short term, for the consumer, okay? And so um, <clears throat> the tariff is fairly unpopular. Now, it's also, uh, the tariff is very unpopular among Americans that make their money by shipping raw materials to Britain because they want to really have this strong relationship. They want the British buying up their raw materials and, and, and then, you know, <clears throat> at a higher price, say, than the people in Lowell, Massachusetts are going to pay and then sending the manufacturing goods back. They want that strong give and take. They want free trade, essentially. And a tariff is going to disrupt their ability to sell raw materials to, say, the British, who are going to be turning cotton into, um, 
and you know nice cloth whatever garments okay now um <clears throat> So, so what you have with that, right, is, is, is a couple of things. The, the South is strongly opposed to the tariff. They want free trade. They want to sell their cotton to the highest bidder, whoever it is, and they don't want the government to interfere with that. They want to make as much money as they can off of the cotton, right? And um, <clears throat> they also want the cotton garments to be affordable so that, there's going to con so that there a lot can be sold and there would continue to be a high demand and the cotton will continue to be desire for fraud uh, by the factories, okay, because people want the cotton garments. Okay, so the South is strongly against the tariffs, okay. In New England, which is really the only region that is where Adams has loyalty, really. In New England um, and in other parts of, of the North, say like New York, but New England is divided on the issue, right, because really the only manufacturing you have in America is in New England, and you have some people that are recognizing that the future could be in that, but it's a very small portion of the people that are involved in it, and of course most New Englanders are shippers, they're, they're merchants who carry goods back and forth, and they have this long history of opposing the tariff, right, back to the War of 1812, they were horrified and outraged when Madison had tried to restrict their trade with Britain, and so there is a strong contingent within New England that opposes the tariff as well, okay? Those who support it tend to be in the West. They tend to be more self-sufficient farmers. Um, but not, you know, but and a lot of them, it is a kind of a, not all of them support it because a lot of them, you know, as consumers don't like it. But especially in, in say, you know, what we call now the Midwest, okay? Like the Ohio River Valley and um, in the Chesapeake Bay area, okay? Now, interestingly, th there's a correlation here because it's these parts of the country, the Chesapeake Bay area and the Ohio River Valley and the Great Lakes region that are benefiting the most from government infrastructure, okay? So the building of roads and canals and a, the first railroad, okay? All of these things are happening in this area and they're gonna allow for the development of cities like Cleveland, Cincinnati, Louisville um, and these are going to take off and become very prosperous places after the Civil War. Um, but there is a cor correlation between places in the West and the Chesapeake region supporting the tariff, which is one way of funding the federal government, and then the investment the federal government has in the infrastructure. So um, <clears throat> a lot of the projects that are being undertaken in these regions, roads and canals, they're being done by private companies but with the support of public finance, okay? So all that is going to, is sort of under the service center. And um, now um, <clears throat> Jackson is going to run for president again in 1828. And all between 1824 and 1828, he's building up that base of support. And he's the clear leader of the Democrat Party. And he is kind of champion, going to be champion, championing the, um, you know, fighting corruption, fighting mismanagement of um, <clears throat> finances, and, you know, restoring, you, you know, the United States to its roots of the sovereign states and the self-sufficient farmer, right? And um, he's going to win in a landslide victory in 1828, and Adams is going to be out, okay? And a lot of people are going to be looking for him to come in and start um, <clears throat> making reforms like lowering the tariffs, uh, dramatically and getting rid of the national bank which is seen to be a mechanism for for controlling and manipulating currency to the advantage of those bankers who are already wealthy right okay and so there's a there's a lot of um, <clears throat> anticipation that that Jackson coming into the presidency is going to have a dramatic impact on the United States all right so we'll start with uh, Jackson all right uh, uh, Friday or Monday. All right.